what are you dreaming about that's going to happen in five years or 10 years, even though the doctor said, well, your life expectancy is only two years, right? People don't live more than two years beyond this. There are thousands, tens of thousands of cases of people living beyond their diagnosis. Why can't it be you? Why can't you make, you know, a five and 10 year plan and plan to dance at your child's or your grandchild's wedding and imagine, you know, what song are you dancing to? Mm -hmm. Lola Dranker is with us today. Lola has been a certified holistic health coach since 2012, and she does some extremely important work on the planet. And I'm really excited for you guys to uh, be able to experience some of the insight that she's gleaned from her work. Her background includes training from the Institute of Integrative Nutrition, Center for Advancement in Cancer Education, and a professional background in medical malpractice in brain injury litigation consulting. She has led personal development retreats in Costa Rica and guides the power of the mind classes for stage four cancer patients at Chipsa Hospital. She also currently serves as a stem cell aftercare specialist at the Cellular Performance Institute in Tijuana. She's also the co-founder of Hero Academy, which is a nonprofit community center and jujitsu school located in Costa Rica. The work that she does at that school focuses on providing underprivileged children with valuable resources such as self-defense training, school supplies, and crucial food care packages. Now, the reason why I invited uh, Loyola to join us today is um, a few months ago, I had um, the great opportunity and, and blessing to cross paths with her. <laughs> what she shared with me was something that was quite profound. Um, and I'd love for her to um, help our audience understand exactly what this is. So with that, Lola, I'm going to let you take over um, and frame up for our audience the seven things that are critical common denominators for people who are going through cancer treatments who seem to have amazing remission experiences that are uncommon, they're profound, and quite frankly, they're often described as a miracle. So if you guys are interested in the seven things that people have in common when they go through these types of experiences, as I say this, I'm getting goosebumps because I know this is going to be so powerful. I'm excited uh, again for um, Lola to join us and to take it away. So Lola, if you wouldn't mind, let's just start off. If you could expand a little bit more on your background because um, your journey to do this work was uh, was, a, was a kind of a winding journey. And so maybe you could help us understand why you're so personally passionate about this work and then we'll get into what it is. First of all, thank you. I'm so excited to be here, Jess, and um, get the message out. And it, I felt a really instant connection and uh, our little chat uh, at Stefan's event um, about the C60 products, which I've been using, by the way, uh, me and my mom, we love it. This message is really, uh, I don't think it's just for cancer patients. Uh, I think these are a lot of messages. You know, these seven things are commonalities of personality type and things we can do in our life to really reflect on where we are emotionally and in the mindset. Um, so I, I think it, it's not limited by that, but it is what I utilize it for. Um, my path, as you heard in the intro, is all over the place. Uh, I'm an immigrant from Uzbekistan. I landed in New York in 1998, um, 10 years old. And shortly after we all had to get jobs because we didn't have a lot of money. And both my parents are attorneys, so they wind up, you know, working at this medical malpractice law firm. And at 12 years old, um, I got kind of like a summer internship there and started learning how to, well, first of all, it was like putting 
medical records in chronological order. Then it moved up to things that were a little more advanced and me questioning like, what are these medical records and what, what are the problems that these patients have after you know car accidents, construction accidents? So the traumatic brain injury part really introduced me to that world of medicine. And uh, I wound up working at that law firm for over 10 years, but one job at that time wasn't enough. So I also had a second job at a holistic health food store. And that's where I learned all the, uh, you know, natural remedies and things that could be done to really help people in an integrative way. And it really clashed with what I was doing at the law firm because if anybody's familiar with lawsuits, the more damages you have, the more medication that you take is more proof for the court to award you more damages and to get more money out of the lawsuit. So there are a lot of doctors that over-prescribe, over-medicate people just because they're in a lawsuit. And plaintiff's attorneys love that because they, they get a chunk of that too. So I was seeing how you know, patients are suffering from being over-medicated. And then I have this holistic side of my experience where people can do things differently. So I wound up leaving the law firm and pursuing the career of a health coach. Uh, and, uh, you know, 11, 12 years ago, wasn't as popular <laughs> as it is now. I worked in one of the only health food stores in my neighborhood. You know, now you can get apple cider vinegar anywhere. Back then, people would drive to us, you know, an hour, an hour and a half just to get some Ezekiel bread and odd things like that. Um, so I really dove into that world and got exposed to how people can do things in a very, very unconventional way. Way I had customers at the health food store who would come in with liver cirrhosis and get some zeolites and milk thistle and supplements and come back, you know, six months later with their clean liver result. Like the cirrhosis going away, the liver regenerating. And I was 16, 17 years old at that time. So it was really impactful uh, for me and kind of set set the stage. I haven't left the industry since and went and did holistic retreats in Costa Rica, started my own private practice. And um, through all those connections, wound up knowing the owners of Chipsa Hospital through studying Gerson therapy. And, and pause me and ask questions <laughs> if you need to. I know it's a long winding road. Like you said, in 2018, my father got diagnosed with lung cancer. And at that point, I was doing my holistic retreats in Costa Rica and living there most of the time, but still attending many masterminds with, with the people who owned Chipsa Hospital. So as soon as my dad was diagnosed, you know, it was 6 a.m. I remember it like yesterday. My my mom called me from New York and she said, you know, we we're in the hospital and dad got just his CT scan and they're saying he has a giant tumor in his lung. And I got on the next plane and by 6 p.m. I was already back in New York um, figuring out what's what's happening. And, uh, you know, we went to Sloan Kettering, the biggest, baddest, um, most amazing cancer hospital in New York. And they gave him just a couple of weeks. They said, you know, we can try uh, checkpoint inhibitors, uh, which was Keytruda, just came out at that time, and everybody was waiting for it to be a miracle drug for lung cancer. Um, but they they said, you know, it's stage four. It was spread to the other lung, to his hip bone, collarbone, um, and it it didn't look good. It was uh, he was losing weight, uh, thirty pounds in six weeks. He lost. My dad wasn't a big guy. So it was very noticeable right away. So I, uh, I called my friends at Chipsa and said, you know, if I get my dad there, would you treat him? Would you try? And they said, yeah, if you can get him here, let's go. Um, I got him there. And within two weeks, uh, his tumor reduced 50%. So miraculous for a 13 centimeter tumor to, you know, 
shrunk to eight centimeters just within 10 days. And, um, and my dad became a believer. He lived for another year and cancer was almost all gone, but he had a heart attack that he didn't survive. Everything I saw during that year at Chipsa just made me believe that there are so many factors that go into cancer healing, the cancer journey, regardless of the outcome, that extension of life and just living life from the moment a person is diagnosed with cancer and how it affects absolutely everything from relationships to business to, you know, um, the self. And it's not just the person that's diagnosed, but it's everything around them and how few resources we're offered through the conventional hospital system and the standard of care you know, for the emotional and the, the mindfulness side of it. Um, so even after my dad passed, I, I moved to San Diego and committed to staying at Chipsa, diving all in and working there in a big way in his honor. Like I never want to leave there. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, first of all, I'm really sorry for your loss. I, my, my father is on the other side as well. And I understand how dynamic and impactful losing your dad is. So I'm, I'm very, I, I'm sorry for that. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is I just want to acknowledge you for your unique, um, life's journey and, and your mission here, because I think that you're, um, you're a living embodiment and an example of um, somebody who, against all odds, can be successful and a massive contributor, adding tons of value to the world and to other human lives, even if you didn't have a a traditional or conventional upbringing, even if you had to struggle um, basically for survival, you know, from leaving a country in a hostile situation to coming to a a new country and having to figure it out at a very young age. So I just want to give you, um, you know, great, great kudos for um, your hard work, your tenacity, your, you know, your desire to not only survive, but to thrive and to be able to take in all of the information from your different environments, working in in a law firm with very, you know, conventional, traditional roles and responsibilities to going down this alternative health and wellness path where you're actually seeing the benefit of um, natural healthy remedies supporting people's lives. And then also being able to, please correct me if I'm wrong here. It sounds like at the beginning of your dad's process in, in hearing this information where he'd been given a short amount of time to live, you were part of an, you know, an energy of inspiration for your dad to consider there might be another path forward. In addition to what he had done, he could do something else to support his longevity. And it sounds like you really helped open his eyes to that potential. Is that accurate? It is accurate. It was really scary actually for me to take on that responsibility in the beginning because you know my dad is a very conventional, traditional medicine guy where, you know, we come from a Soviet background. Doctors are authority they're very much godlike if their opinion is is valued and followed um so when my dad got his his first and only full chemo dose and you know he told me don't offer me none of your voodoo medicine and none of this alternative stuff and and my family was very you know they were looking at me like don't like don't push your things on him and I respected that, you know, I was right there holding my dad's hand when he was getting his first chemo infusion. Um, and three days after the chemo, my dad woke me up in the middle of the night from the nerve pain and all the things he was feeling as a side effect. And, and he said, look, I think we need to go to, we need to call the doctor or go to the emergency room. So much pain. So we went to um, the way Sloan Kettering works is uh, if you don't have an appointment with your oncologist, if you have any issues between appointments, which can take months to, to be seen, you just have to go to their ER, which is the Sloan Kettering ER. And when you walk in there, you know, it's, uh, I get emotional thinking about it, but it's, it's people having issues you know, on their cancer journey. So 
people are in a really, really fragile state and they're aligning the halls of this emergency room, you know, no hair, very frail, um, people connected to IVs who can't speak or they're to the point they're so emaciated that it looks like there's no life in that body. And I just remember looking at my dad and when we walked in there and he looked at me, he said, oh my God, don't ever let me get to that point. He said, I don't care if you have to shoot me, kill me, give me some poison, but I don't ever want to get to that point. And it it shook him to the core to just see where that path leads, you know, with long-term chemo palliative care where it's not curative where it's just to try extend life and beat the cancer down to not take over so quickly and when we got home uh, from there he said you know I think I want to try your stuff (laughs) part of me was relieved because I wanted to of course do everything possible to save my dad we had an amazing relationship he's my hero and um, my best friend. We talked every day. Um, But on the other hand, it was, I took on that responsibility. Like, what if I didn't sleep for months thinking, oh my God, what if this doesn't work? You know, the family is going to really blame me. Like, you should have stuck with Sloan Kettering. Who do you think you are thinking you can give them something different? Um, And when we got to Chipsa, I thought I was in big trouble because the hospital, the building is old. (laughs) The doctors are really young, uh, which is uh, as much as uh, people think, you know, being a young doctor equals inexperience, especially here in the U.S., you know, the the time to get your medical degree and finish medical school and finish residency. by the time you get to that other side, a lot of doctors are in their early 30s just starting out. Um, but in Mexico, it's different. You know, college is medical school. So by the time they're 22 years old and then they have a two year residency, by 24, they're full fledged, ready to practice physician. So in their early 30s, they already had 10 years of experience. But going there after the U.S., it was a little shocking. And um, my dad was like, where did you bring me? (laughs) Um, But two weeks into the program, you know, we did Gerson therapy, which was um, 13 fresh pressed juices, organic juices a day to nourish the system without doing a lot of digestion. Uh, That's the the background of the Gerson therapy, coffee enemas for detoxing the liver from chemo and other things. Um, but at the same time with, with the nutrition and detox stuff, there's also um, dendritic cell vaccines and there's another medication called Valivax that helped a uh, tumor stop producing blood vessels. So stop feeding off the immune system and growing. So there's a lot of advanced medicine mixed in with the more, uh, you know, nutrition and mind, mindfulness stuff. And after two weeks of that and having that MRI in hand with the tumor half the size after just two weeks, my dad said, I don't care if my doctor is 15 years old. <laughs> I don't care if they want me to like drink some funky stuff or how the hospital looks. I'm I'm a believer and I'm so grateful. I'm feeling good. And the whole trajectory changed. And he became an inspiration to other patients um, who were coming in, you know, two weeks, three weeks later after he was there and having that same reaction of being scared of the newness and the doctors looking young and the building looking old. And he would come up to people and be like, hey, I see the way you're looking at this whole thing, but let me show you my MRI. And he would just go around the room and visit patients in their rooms and and help them and lifting their spirits and changing their mindset. And, you know, he was an attorney his whole life. So it, it helped that he was very persuasive and smart and logical. Uh, and it really changed that 
that trajectory where the family was enrolled, he was enrolled, and the results were just the, the amazing side effect. That's wonderful. So I have to say this because this conversation will be shared on YouTube. Um, our intent here today is not necessarily to promote anything other than share with our audience these um, seven common denominators that are connected to um, the power of the mind that really help support this miraculous healing event that Lola has seen time and time again throughout um, her work in this space. So I'm excited to go ahead and, and shift gears here, Lola. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and I'm going to let you talk through these common factors that really support a miraculous healing journey, which many people um, who are in our uh, C60 community are, you know, passionate about healthy lifestyle choices. They're fully embracing them and they're on an individual journey to transform their health. So I think that these seven tips are going to be very beneficial to everyone, whether you're struggling with news like Lola had, and you have a significant uh, health crisis either with yourself or with a family member, or you're dealing with, with hard things in life, which most of us are, um, <laughs> I think this is going to be really wonderful for you guys. Just to intro, psychoneuroimmunology is a study of, you know, how our psychology and neurology and our immune system all work together. Um, and I love this quote here, uh, and that's why I included it in my presentation, uh, stress-related disease emerges predominantly out of the fact that we so often activate a physiological system that has evolved for responding to acute physical emergencies. So think, you know, evolution-wise, being attacked by a tiger or being chased by a tiger. Um, and it was reserved for that. But Nowadays, we turn it on for months on end, worrying about mortgages, relationships, or promotions. And that's powerful because we, we stay in the state of stress and producing cortisol when we don't need to. We don't acknowledge the fact that we turned on this system and we, we get stuck in what you know is popular now to call the survival mode. Mm. So, um, just a little, you know, background to psychoneuroimmunology. So uh, th these seven things um, are just the commonalities that were observed through many different studies that I went through um, trying to save my dad and trying to see what would make an impact emotionally and what are the things I can control and I can contribute to his journey from studying all of these things. And uh, one of the first and most important things is acceptance, right? A lot of times when people get diagnosed with cancer, they, um, they don't want to believe it. One, two, they may be in shock. Uh, three, sometimes people go, you know, off the deep end into positive affirmations and saying, you know what, I'm not even going to acknowledge that the C word won't say the word and say, actually, I don't know what this diagnosis is all, of, is all about, but I don't even have cancer. So I'm not going to address it that way. When yeah. you say it's true too, whether it's cancer or any other kind of disease, that it's it's when people won't even acknowledge it. So it doesn't, doesn't have to be just cancer. It could be any, any issue that you're facing it, that the first step is really to accept that this is a reality that you need to work through. Correct. Because just like GPS on a car in order to get to a destination, you know, in addition to the destination for you to get directions, the GPS has to know where you're starting from, right? And the ways to get to your destination may be different. Um, you might take a different route, right? A longer one, a shorter one, avoid highways, whatever it is. There's, we have many people getting to the same destination using hundreds of different ways. But if you don't know exactly where you're starting from, it's impossible to, to get to a destination. That acceptance is really vulnerable and courageous to say, wow, okay, I do have this diagnosis and it sucks. And now I have to figure out how to deal with it. And that could be, you know, that could be facing divorce. That could be facing bankruptcy facing, um, you know, a business partner causing a mutiny and stealing some of your employees or clients. 
all of these things could be tragic, especially if a person's identity is all tied up in that thing that they're losing. Um, it can be just as traumatic and cause the same type of emotional mourning that we would as if a person is dying. So as if we're experiencing like death of that persona or that identity is taking taking a toll um, on that. So that acceptance of, of where we are allows us to really, our mind and our emotions to process and how do we move on? Like, where can we take the lessons from how we got here? Um, you know, what is the reality of what's happening right now? What are all the things that are true in this moment? How you're feeling, what you're experiencing. Do you have a knot in your stomach? Do you have, you know, trouble sleeping, trouble uh, getting your breath under control? What are the physical manifestations of accepting where you're at and ignoring it does not does not help us take the next step having a very healthy acceptance of the facts is the most important place to start and once you have acceptance that's when it's time to say okay here's where i am now you need to take control of what do we do now what is the next step right there are a lot of decisions to make if you're facing bankruptcy Right. You have to figure out, do I need an attorney? What is the next step? Do I need to get my finances in order? If you're facing divorce. Same thing. Do I need an attorney? Are there children involved? What's the best for the children? Um, what are the consequences of friendships, right? Shared friendships. A lot of people don't talk about that. In divorce, we not only lose, you know, our partner for whatever circumstances, but there's a whole lifestyle and a whole community uh that is lost and that that's very, very traumatic you know in cancer it's not just about which treatment are we choosing do we go conventional do we go holistic do we get seven opinions or just one um it's about do i have a will do i have to talk a certain way with my kids to make a plan do i want to make sure that that my family knows how I want my end of life to be or how I want decisions made for me if for whatever reason at the end of the road, I'm not able to make decisions for myself. These are all very difficult um, conversations and decisions to make, but the only person that can do that is the person that's going through it. So taking control of those decisions and not just, you know, having other people figuring things out for you is really important because if you do that, then at the end of the day, you have the power, no matter what the outcome of the decision was, the power was always yours. There, there will never be room in your mind saying, you know, well, I wish I did it my way, which is, um, you know, there's a book on the top regrets of the dying and the number one regret is I wish I lived my life my way and did mm. things the way I wanted to. And we very often give up control to, you know, whoever we think is the authority in our life to make those decisions. There's one thing that that's really powerful for me in, in this taking control part is we're in a consulting age where we have influencers and consultants and therapists and, you know, people that give advice. And we have an unlimited number of podcasts where people, you know, that's their go-to for uh, instead of just entertainment, that's where they get their, this is what I should do type of information. And I always say, if you're finding that you have a problem that you kind of have an inkling of what you want to do, but then you keep going around and asking your best friend for advice, your parent for advice, and then you go and hire somebody because you're not hearing that thing that you're wanting to hear. And I ask people, you know, ask yourself, mm -hmm. what are you pretending not to know when you do that? So when you're on your 10th person asking for advice on a particular issue 
what is it that you're pretending not to know? And your way of avoiding that, pretending what you're not knowing, not acknowledging, may be an outcome that you want to avoid or responsibility that you don't want to take. That's powerful. All right. Ready to move on to the next one? Let's do it. So you took acceptance of where you're at. You took control, started making all these extremely difficult decisions to move on to the next step. But it's hard and it gets lonely because, you know, whatever the traumatic experience is, we lose people that are not comfortable being around other people going through difficult things. You know, a lot of times um, uh, I hear a lot of cancer patients say, you know, I kind of I lost my friends because now they don't treat me as, you know, Nancy. They treat me as, you know, Nancy's doctor dying from cancer. So they're always feeling sorry. They're always, you know, or not wanting to come over or check in and treat the person the same way as when they were quote unquote normal, you know, and healthy. Um, they lose and mourn those relationships that way. And it's really damaging to people going through these traumatic events. Um, so it's really important to just kind of regroup and get the proper support in, in the journey. Um, that could be physical support, right? We hire fitness coaches or for a cancer patient, if things get to be too much around the house, hire somebody to come help you out, to clean, to cook, whatever it is, as long as it's supportive uh, to your situation. Spiritual support. That is the number one uh, regret, actually, for a lot of cancer patients that, um, you know, when you're in treatment, one of the things they often say is, you know, there's nobody there in the treatment room with you, no matter how many friends you have, no matter how many, you know, support people you have, when you're alone with your pain to the point where you can't even register a voice that's talking to your friend that's there because you can't focus. Internally, it's just you and your spirituality. So finding that stronghold and having that internal support, whatever that looks like, right? A connection with the universe, the source, if you're a Christian, Jewish, Muslim, whatever it is, having that spiritual connection, knowing that something's got your back, no matter what. It's very powerful. Another part of that is who's going to hold you accountable when you, you know, you're supposed to follow a diet, your, your cancer healing diet, but you want cookies. Who's going to be around there? Who's not just going to be like, oh, all right, it's okay. You can have that, but hold you accountable because accountability is love, right? When we know somebody's weaknesses, and it's having the courage to invite that friend or that person and to have them regularly in your life, knowing that they're going to call you out on your step. The fourth thing that was a big commonality uh, among all the people that, um, you know, had long lasting remission was they made drastic lifestyle changes that were physical, right? Food, water, exercise, sleep, making sure that uh, the cleaning products, the um, beauty products, uh, supplements, all the things that, you know, we're both very passionate about making sure that we're not healing one thing, but then toxifying, you know, with the body wash that we use or taking supplements that we think are healthy or using skincare that we think is healthy, but really adding more toxins and chemicals into our, our body. Um, the air. Um, some people live in places where the air pollution is really bad and they, there's certain particles that you want to make sure, especially for lung cancer patients, um, to have uh, air purifiers in your home to get, get those particles out of the air that you're breathing. And um, I just want to note that when I went into this, you know, deep dive into research on cancer healing and cancer integrative therapies. I thought that this was going to be the, the end all, the physical part of it. 
for food, water, exercise, you know, there has to be a magic supplement that cures cancer. There has to be a magic diet, the silver bullet. And uh, from what I've seen over the past five years, it's just not, not the case. It's just one part of the entire journey. Correct. And, um, you know, we've, I've had patients that were herbalists that lived their whole life in forests, woods. And um, I had one amazing woman, um, she's passed on, but she lived her whole life in the trailer in the woods and, and an amazing property with clean mountain water and did the, you know, walked barefoot on the ground and did the grounding and the earthing. But at the end, you know, she had a lot of emotional issues that she just refused to let go of. And we talked about it many times where, you know, it created this disharmony. So no matter what she was doing physically, emotionally, she was in turmoil, which eventually, you know, didn't, didn't help in her journey. Okay. Well, to that next point, then it sounds like it's extremely important, not just to acknowledge and take great care of the physical, but you also have to do your due diligence on your emotional cleanup as well. Yes. And this is probably the hardest one. Um, I would say for me, um, you know, going through it with my dad, but really reflecting on this for myself and really taking a very sobering look, you know, uh, asking myself, what type of person am I? How do I show up in other people's lives, right? Because we're so quick to judge other people and label them. Uh, and we, even the people we love, we can kind of give the negatives and positives of their personality traits. And we can say, I love her, but she talks a lot or, I love her, but she's always late. And <laughs> whatever that thing is, a lot right. of times our loved ones, they love us despite all those things, but they have a much clearer view of how we show up. Yeah. So really taking this internal deep dive and saying, you know, do I have boundaries? Am I a yes mm-hmm. person? Am I a responsible person or am I always late and I keep people waiting and it makes me, even if I value their time, maybe it makes them experience me as irresponsible or not caring of them. How do I show up for other people in their life and how, how am I perceived? What am I not seeing about the way I show up in the world, right? Do I hold doors for people? or do I take charge when there are complicated situations or do I retreat and look for ways to become a victim? And the first thing I do, instead of thinking, you know, how can I solve this thing for myself? I think about, oh, poor me. And let me call every person in my phone and mass text message. Oh my God, you know, you guys not going to believe what just happened to me. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is bad. And, you know, staying in that victim state because it's something we learned when we were young and it's a way to get attention right we can get attention many and and love in many different ways we can get attention for being powerful we we can get attention for being uh, weak and vulnerable and uh, being a victim and uh it's it's a touchy situation because there there has to be a balance um of that and that self-awareness really brings the opportunity to change things. You know, you can say uh, a lot of people in recovery, right? They have to be very careful in engineering their environment to support their recovery and to support them from going back into, you know, falling back into the habits that got them in trouble in the first place. But the only way to engineer that environment and to create that lifestyle change, that emotional support is to make sure that the people around you are, are on the same page. So if you are doing your best to, you know, shift your mind into a positive state all the time, especially because 
you know, if you're a cancer patient, it's really important to have positivity and a positive outlook, you know, despite all odds. But then you have a neighbor that's a negative Nancy that comes in and just just pours the negativity on. Did you see the news and the world's coming to the end? And, the, you know, and oh my God, poor you, you're dealing with diagnosis. I heard nobody ever survives this, what you're going through. How oh, are you boy. going to deal? It's a very, it happens all the time. And it's a very different experience than having a person that's bringing their uplifting, positive, motivational, you know, everything always works out. No matter what happens, you'll get through this. And even if the odds are not in your favor, I bet we can search every diagnosis in the book and every type of cancer that there's been around. There's at least one person that survived. And maybe you could be number two, right? And that's what I always tell my patients that have the really rare cancers. If somebody else did it, why not you be next? And that spiritual emotional charge is is important for all of us, no matter what we're dealing with. Are we engineering that environment to be supportive and positive and uplifting? Or are we, you know, falling for the misery loves company crowd? Oh yeah. Okay. That's really powerful. You find that this is a, this is also equally hard for people to do. To me, this this seems like a, a really really powerful lever if you can if you can figure out how to do it. Yes. So forgiveness, um, I feel, is like a a spiral. You know, there's levels to it. When you you think you let some things go, but there's still a little bit of residue, mm-hmm. and you think back to certain situations and things or um, situations with people that even if you keep the person in your life and you make make peace with them there still might be residue of a situation that you haven't forgiven yourself for putting yourself in those situations um or you may not you know be so easy to forgive yourself for making a decision that impacted not just yourself but other people so forgiveness is um you could go as deep as you want or stay on the surface. But one thing always stays true. If there's something that you hold energy or you're upset about, or you have that feeling of something is not fair, even if it's 17 years ago, you know, AT&T or Sprint overcharged you on a cell phone bill and you fought it and fought it because it was unfair. You knew a hundred percent you weren't the one using those you know, daytime minutes before we had, (laughs) you know, those nights and weekends and whatever else. If you still think back to, you know, that time that it was unfair and you were overcharged, and this is such a trivial example, but no, but it's perfect. I mean, like we all have resentments and chips on our shoulder about any number of things, right? So I think you're making a really good point. (laughs) Everybody has those situations where where things were just not fair. Mm-hmm. And you really know in your heart of hearts that you were in the right, but the outcome didn't didn't serve you and it wasn't fair. There was no justice. Right. And we're seeing a lot of that in the world now where a lot of conflict is happening because we know something is not fair, should not be happening but we we can't get the outcome that we want. And it's having the grace for yourself and for all the people involved in whatever situations you you need to let go of. Because if you don't, you, you lose the power, you lose your peace and your brain just keeps replaying the loop of those situations in the background, even if you're not aware of it, right? But giving ourselves the grace to forgive and move forward is is so underrated it's so not talked about it's you know it's it's looked at as giving your power away versus uh reclaiming your power and forgiveness is not making another person right 
just because you forgive them or not making a situation right or wrong. Forgiveness is completely transcending that and completely moving, moving through the situation and saying this happened myself and I forgive the other person doesn't mean I'm going to let this happen again. And it, it's creating freedom because of that. I think that that's really an empowered perspective that you can access peace through the grace that you give a situation via the, the tool of forgiveness. So thank you for reminding all of us of that, or just teaching some of us that if we haven't thought about it before. Um, are you ready to do the, the number one, maybe, I don't know if this is the most powerful tool that people could access, but I, I don't know if you would describe it that way, but should, shall we move um, on? I would describe it. Yeah, we can, we can do that. Um, anything you want me to elaborate on, uh, I'm happy to, or we can move on. My favorite, once you do all the work, right? Because you can't really get to a clear vision that's not held back, that's not, you know, bogged down by anything. Um, if you went through one through six and really, you know, upheaved your life and turned things upside down and had some honest conversations with yourself and removed anything that's negative or not aligned, right? You engineered the the social environment, the physical environment. What do you do now? Well, one of the most powerful things we do as humans is work towards something, right? And that vision is so powerful. And, you know, vision boards are so popular right now, but a lot of people put very materialistic things on the vision board, right? You want to talk about manifesting abundance and wealth. And we put the type of home you want to live in and the type of car you want to drive, the type of physique you might want to have, you know, uh, cut out your, your head and put it on a really fit person's body and think about the six pack and the abs. And that's been around for a long time. But when you go through something really traumatic and you really want to shift to a different vision of your life, because one of the things that people fall into that I, I feel is like a little trap is when people are in those situations that are are very horrific and they say, I really just want to go back to the way things were. Or, yeah. And there's this ignorance almost of, well, the way things were got, got you to, to this place. Yeah. So moving from, from that to, to creating a new vision of, I want things to be this way. And maybe it includes 80% of the way things were, but you have to add, okay, what is your vision of you? What type of person are you being? Do you want to bring more love into your life that that requires for you to be more loving? Right? Do you want more peace in your life? Well, that requires you to be more peaceful. And it's that way of being, of bringing, bringing that to the world because then you attract that in the world. So you're a very, you know, loud person that loves talking to people and is very passionate and you want more of that in the world. If you show up that way in the world, well the other passionate people are going to be like, "Oh, hey, she's exactly like me." So I'm I'm going to go talk to her. They're not going to go talk to somebody that's completely, you know, opposite of them or not aligned with the same things that you're doing. So when you connect with people, if you want to bring more people into your life or you envision your life with certain types of relationships, well, be that first, you know, very cliche, be the change you want to see in this world, but it's true. It works. Um, and, you know, big vision is your contribution to the world. Uh, a lot of people don't have this vision is how can you impact the world? And a lot of people think you have to open a nonprofit and do some crazy things and invest a lot of money in order to have a vision of being a big contributor in the world. 
but it can be as simple as you saying, you know what, today I woke up and I'm going to make it a point to hold the door for someone, or I'm going to make it a point to give up my seat for somebody just because, just because, just having that on your mind, or I'm going to smile at a stranger, or I'm going to tell somebody uh, that they look really beautiful today, just walking down the street. And creating that ripple effect. None of those things involve money. None of those things involve any sort of time commitment. It's just being committed to being a human that is making some sort of contribution in life. And that, you know, they say just acknowledging a person and saying hi to them has saved so many people from suicide because they feel unseen, unwanted unloved or misunderstood so something even so simple you never know what the ripple effect could be so my invita- invitation is make the vision big right make the vision of who you're being the way you're being for your family for your grandkids for your children for your community each person ha- has so much power so much power. You change one person and then they get inspired and uh, do something positive for another person. And that's the ripple effect. It can go on forever and ever. And uh, that's, that's what I want to leave off with. Thank you. That's so powerful. One of the things when, when I first heard this message from you that really struck me is that you said it was important for the vision to extend beyond just the cure of the disease or beyond, because oftentimes people would say, I'm not going to focus on anything outside of solving this one physical issue that I'm dealing with right now. But you said that the, the kind of the magic in, in the vision was having something outside of that particular situation that you're going to do once you were healed once you were better, once you had your energy back, what you were going to go reclaim to contribute and put out there. So any more insights on when you say a big vision, what that really means? In the case of cancer patients or anybody struggling with really debilitating disease and and looking forward to just getting clear of that, right? Just feeling better and not being able to extend a vision of anything beyond that. Well, I challenge you, you know, what's beyond the clear PET scan? What are you dreaming about that's going to happen in five years or 10 years, even though the doctor said, well, your life expectancy is only two years, right? People don't live more than two years beyond this. Well, there are thousands, tens of thousands of cases of people living beyond their diagnosis. Why can't it be you? Why can't you make, you know, a five and 10 year plan and plan to dance at your child's or your grandchild's wedding and imagine, you know, what song are you dancing to? Mm -hmm. Who's going to be there? And really living in that vision to inspire you when the treatments get really tough and you, you feel in your mind and your emotion, like giving up. But if that vision is so vivid and real in your mind, those could be the things that keep you going. You know, um, there are so many, you know, my dad thought about all the projects that he's going to do as soon as he's feeling better. He loved to tinker around the house and like rebuild his work desk and, and paint things. And people would tell him like, oh, why are you thinking about that? You just need to get better. And he's like, oh, I I know I'll get better. But then then when I get better, I need to do all these things. And he would always make these plans. And my mom would tell him, Roman, you you can't go anywhere. We have nine grandchildren and we're dancing at all of their weddings. (laughs) And he would repeat that all the time, you know. And um, yeah, I didn't get the outcome that I wanted with my dad because of the heart attack. but all those things and the trajectory and his mood and the quality of that bonus year of life was incredible. The family was always in a celebratory and, you know, grateful mood because of the, you know, he was there and that could be the vision. 
is it doesn't matter how many years left. It doesn't matter if uh, you were rich and you went bankrupt and now you're broke. You could be happy and broke. You could be contributing and broke. You could be happy and divorced. You could be contributing and divorced. Those things are not mutually exclusive, but it takes this vision of what is the type of person that I want to be? Or who is the type of person that responds this way in these situations and not, you know, creating this victim mentality? And I, I think that's the way to really change the world or your world, at least, at the very least. So beautifully said. Thank you so much. Do you want to say anything about these beautiful people? Yeah. So actually, there we had this. Uh, this was beautiful. We had two pastors in one at one time. So the gentleman all the way on the right and the checkered shirt, he was a pastor, and uh, the gentleman right behind me in the lilac shirt, um, he was a minister. This was right after a Power of the Mind class. You see people with their IV poles. These are all cancer patients. Um, they they would talk about, you know, we would talk about all these things, forgiveness, and and the ministers and the pastors would then go around and pray over people. And on this particular day, they just decided to like choir sing Amazing Grace. Oh, wow. And it was, it moved people to tears. And the experience of that was, was magical. And they were all hugging and you know, singing and enjoying this time while they're all there stage four getting cancer treatments. You know, they created this beautiful connected experience versus just sitting there, you know, sulking and and being helpless. They took that power. And, um, you know, it says impress to express there is because um, the, the big notice is we go through our, our life uh, trying to impress whether a younger version of ourselves or people in our life that are the authority. We're trying to impress people with our clothes and looks and achievements and career goals. And, you know, my kid is more talented than your kid, whatever it is. Um, there's a lot of impressing that goes on. But when patients are faced in, with the diagnosis that uh, is is very time limited and people are given a very limited time or people are just facing death, whether it's in combat and, you know, in tragic situations and they're aware of their mortality, they go really quickly to expressing their love and their feelings. You know, we, we heard it on all the calls from 9-11, people calling their family and saying, I just want to tell you that I love you. That's all. That's the most important thing that people speak about is I miss you. I love you. I've always appreciated you. And those are always the last words is that expression of, of feeling and emotion. We don't have to wait until we die or until we're faced with those tragic situations and our mortality and really facing it. So today, go go out there and tell somebody how you appreciate them and how you love them and and the gift they are to you. Uh, without without, they may think you're a little crazy today <laughs> for doing that out of the blue, but it's it's an amazing experience to do that. Lola, I I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much for for sharing your wisdom and your insights with us. Um, like I said at the, at the beginning of this conversation, I, I'm I'm so impressed by you and what you contribute to the planet and just your goodness, your light, your generosity, um, your thoughtfulness, your leadership. Thank you. Um, if you guys are Thank interested so in learning more about Lola and her work, um, I'm gonna we're gonna put uh, links to uh, Chipsa and the stem cell work that she does. Um, as I understand it. Uh, Lola and her team uh, have gotten a lot of um, attention lately, specifically because Joe Rogan's been talking about some of the impressive work that they're doing with stem cell therapy. So uh, <laughs> this isn't a fad. People are figuring uh, that there's some people are figuring this out. So um, Lola, before we part, um, 
Do you have any final words of encouragement for our audience or anybody out there who um, they're facing a tough situation? Uh, they've got your resources now, but um, they're struggling with maybe one or two of, of those components. How to maybe move through that so you can really enjoy your own miraculous healing um, or, or really positive beneficial changes in your life. I think the main thing to keep in mind is there is nobody on this planet that has anything figured out. There are no guarantees. Um, I think we would all be in a very different place if somebody had all the answers. And it's when you're stuck, just really quiet down and breathe and listen to to the voice within trust yourself i mean so many of us lose that trust maybe because we haven't forgiven some decisions that we made and we wound up in places where you know we got ourselves there so we feel like well i don't know the right answer i can't make that right decision because who am i well you are your world Right. All the cells that exist within you, your emotions, your heart, your mind, um, even if it led you astray at some point, the the basis of it is is love and trust. So just trust yourself and do the best you can. Just just do that. Beautifully said. Thank you so much, Lola. Um, thank you, everyone, for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye.